In order to understand the mind, we've opened our minds to see what hasn't been glimpsed, to break through into new levels of discovery. We ask questions that drive research today so that it may become the cures of tomorrow. We are explorers who delve into the most complex structure known to man so that our most challenging questions can be solved and committed to discover the treatments that turn mental illness into mental health. We envision a day when Alzheimer's is a distant memory. When autism is just another human variation. When depression is overcome, addictions are released, and a paradigm shift in beliefs erases the pain of stigma. We are at the forefront of grasping the biology of genius and creativity and the complex links between the mind and body. Bringing together extraordinary minds across disciplines, interacting to find the answers that can heal our most human challenges, and training the next generation to go even further. This is the center of a revolution in neuroscience. Here, we strive to open our minds even further. Because we must. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vicki Goodman. I'm the founder and president of the Friends of the Semmel Institute. And on behalf of our board and our Open Mind Committee, headed up by the wonderful Carol Halpern, with Deborah Davidson, Stephanie Lushing, and Mia Silverman, and Wendy Kelman, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation. We are so honored this evening to have with us renowned author and professor, Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, who will speak to us about her new book, co-authored by Katherine Bowers, who is also here with us this evening. Their book is Wildhood, The Astounding Connection between animal and human adolescence. In Wildhood, Dr. Natterson Horowitz uses the, the lenses of evolutionary biology, neuroscience, and animal behavior to better understand the species-spanning challenges of growing up. So in addition to being a preeminent author, Dr. Natterson Horowitz is a visiting professor of human evolutionary biology at Harvard and a professor of medicine here at UCLA, what I call a classic underachiever. <laughs> at Harvard, she teaches the course Coming of Age on Planet Earth, which is based on her research that focuses on the natural world as a source of insights into human pathology and developmental challenges. We are so excited that Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz is here for the second time. She and Catherine were here when their book was launched, Zubiquity, in 2012. And it has become a huge bestseller. It was a finalist in the American Association for the Advancement of Science Excellent in Science Book Award, a Smithsonian top book of 
2012, and a Discover Magazine Best Book of the Year. It has been translated into seven languages and has been chosen as a common read at universities across the country. And just to emphasize how important Dr. Natterson Horowitz's topic of research is, and this is quite astounding, the Nobel Assembly selected bio-inspired medicine as the theme for its 219 Nobel Conference and invited Dr. Natterson Horowitz to open this year's conference with her address at the Nobel Forum in Stockholm. So I see a lot of new faces out here this evening, and I'm so thrilled, and also a lot of our familiar faces, so thank you all for being here. For those of you who are new, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Friends of the Semmel Institute. We are the philanthropic support group for the world-renowned Semmel Institute, um, which has a faculty of over 350 clinicians and researchers who work collaboratively to develop new treatments for illnesses of the mind and brain that affect 46.6 million people every year in this country. We are honored to present the Open Mind as a free public service to the community where we bring together thought leaders in science and culture to present programs about mental health issues. The Friends also support research through our Friends Scholar Program that awards yearly grants to outstanding early career neuroscientists who are at the forefront of making new discoveries about the mind and brain. Now, none of this would be possible without the support of audience members like you. For those of you who are already a part of our Open Mind community, we are very, very grateful for your support. And those of you who are here for the first time and have not yet joined, we hope that you will support our work. Um, you can join by visiting our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. You'll also find there a calendar of our upcoming exciting events. On February 9th, we are going to present a play. It's a Sunday at 2 p.m. called Manic Monologues, which uh, is a group of students from Stanford who were wanted to change the conversation about mental health in this country and wrote vignettes that they are going to present. So we're very excited. And following that, Dr. Jared Diamond is going to be joining us. So you don't want to miss these events. They are really going to be fabulous. And we hope to see you all there. So now, without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Nat Barbara natterson -Hort. I think I'm, we're good, here we go. Welcome. Thank you so much, first of all, thank you again to, um, to the Friends of Semmel Institute for inviting me here tonight. I'm incredibly honored and I'm so pleased that so many of my colleagues and friends and family are here, and especially Catherine Bowers, as you'll um, learn my, my partner in research and writing and teaching over the last 10 years. So this is really an exciting moment to be back at UCLA. Well, if you go into any biology classroom, pretty much in the United States, you'll see probably, if you look, a poster somewhere that says nothing in biology makes sense outside the light of evolution. And maybe not in Alabama, <laughs> everywhere except Alabama. It was um, the title of an essay that Theodosius Dobzhansky published in 1973. And since tonight I'm gonna to be talking about the nature of basically vulnerability, but the nature of adolescent vulnerability, and since nothing about the neurobiology that underlies the emotions and behaviors of adolescence makes sense outside the light of adolescence, and since nothing about the reproductive physiology and endocrinology that triggers puberty and instigates sexual activity makes sense outside the light of evolution, Tonight's talk is going to be called Nothing in Adolescence Makes Sense Outside the Light of Evolution. Well, tonight I'm going to make the case to you that by looking across species and evolutionary time, we can 
increase how we understand why adolescents are so vulnerable to accidents and injuries, better understand adolescent vulnerability to sexual coercion and exploitation and other forms of exploitation, gain a greater understanding of the vulnerability of adolescents and young adults to mental illnesses, including anxiety and depression. And finally, through these insights, hopefully reduce stigma associated with not only mental illness, but many of the vulnerable conditions that um, adolescents uh, are, well, they're more vulnerable to. I mean, this is, there's a unique vulnerability during this developmental phase. And in doing so, um, diffuse some of the negativity and so hopefully um, decrease the vulnerability. Well, those are some pretty big claims. And I have, I think, about 55 minutes. I like to go a little under so we have time for discussion. So here is the plan. I'm going to start by very briefly telling you my personal journey and um, an extremely superficial version of the methodology that we have been using to make some of these connections that I'll present tonight. Uh, then I'm going to share three examples of, um, uh, well, I'm going to start by talking about what I mean by the nature of vulnerability and then go on to give three examples um, of how we can use this evolutionary and competitive, comparative insights to better understand. First, um, we're going to start with risk taking and uh, increased accident and injury rates. Second, we'll look at sexuality and sexual vulnerability. And finally, we'll look at mental illness and then talk a little bit about the potential to use this comparative approach to decrease stigma, et cetera. All right, well, here's my personal journey very quickly. I'm from LA. I grew up about a mile and a half away. Um, and um, I'm the product of two psychotherapists. Um, when I was growing up, uh, my parents used to make a joke, which, you know, which was that they were, it was a mixed marriage because he was a Freudian and she was a Jungian. <laughs> And she's not really a Jungian, but um, at the time, I thought that was very funny. I, I don't know if it's funny or not. But the, but the point of showing this slide is that um, from, for as long as I can remember, from my earliest um, really memories, a, a conversation about why human beings behave the way they do, um, why they do the things that they do, why they feel the things that they feel, it was sort of baked into um, my understanding of the world and my approach to it. Well, I ended up going to college, and um, I didn't know that my freshman biology teacher was um, such a, at that time, he was becoming notorious, but um, it was E.O. Wilson, who had written, had published uh, Sociobiology in 1975. And I really did not know that I was stepping into what was, in essence, a, a cultural and um, intellectual and scientific war between um, those who really wanted to begin to turn to the animal world to identify patterns and common mechanism and biology to better understand human life, and others who were very concerned with how misguided um, uh, attempts to turn to nature to inform human life had created some of the travesties um, during the Second World War. And in fact, one of the um, sort of leaders of this um, group, this, the, the counterpoint to Wilson sociobiology was Stephen Jay Gould, who um, I was fortunate enough to uh, have as one of my thesis advisors by the time I was a senior. So even though I didn't know it and I hadn't intended, and when I look back, I think, wow, I was really early on exposed to this conversation about how are we going to understand human behavior? How are we going to understand human life? How can we responsibly and scientifically, credibly, and and um, in a way that's helpful and reproducible, turn to the natural world, what are the issues? Well, I ended up finishing medical school at college, went to medical school, and I started um, after medical school, I, I went into the family business, which was becoming a therapist. And I was here. I was at, here at the NPI before it was the Semmel Institute. And um, now when I look back, it was 1988 that I started my residency. And that was actually a pretty special year because that was the year that Prozac, which was the first selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, was available in the United States. And so my training really straddled the old school psychodynamic, sort of psychoanalytically informed training, and also began incorporating some of the biological. So I was really um, at that interface. And I'll circle back to that um, as I talk. 
Um, I then ended up uh, moving beyond psychiatry. I wanted to train in internal medicine, which I did, and um, ultimately in cardiology, and spent the next about 20 years here um, in the division of cardiology, taking care of human beings with heart attacks and high cholesterol and um, hypertension. And then one day I got um, um, a call from one of the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo um, asking for some cardiovascular imaging assistant for, assistance for one of their chimpanzees who had had a neurological event. And that experience, um, you know, there, this happened over a series of, um, of several years, actually. I had an opportunity to um, image a wide range of animals there and spent a fair amount of time with the veterinarians there, listening to them on rounds discussing the management of metastatic breast cancer in a lion or uh, decompensated heart failure in a taper or the management of fluoxetine, of, a, of Prozac, in a bird who was feather plucking. Now, I had, at that point, I was ready, you know, I was a professor of medicine. I felt that I knew quite a lot. I was boarded in several things. Um, I, I, you know, and yet I had almost no knowledge um, about the spontaneously occurring diseases of non-human animals. Except, I mean, I knew one veterinarian until I went to the zoo, who was our, you know, family vet. So um, to make a very long story short, it's not the subject of tonight's talk, I had the great good fortune of being introduced to um, Catherine Bowers, an animal behaviorist and a broad um, thinker and writer. And the two of us have spent the last um, decade turning to the natural world for insights into human health and development. The, um, the first book that we wrote, Zubiquity, uh, really advanced a species-spanning approach to health. And um, we started also conferences to bring together veterinary schools and medical schools, something that was not done before. The fields were so siloed. The first ubiquity conference was here at UCLA. It, our partner was UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And this handshake between the then dean of the UCLA School of Medicine, Gene Washington, and the then dean of UC Davis Vet Med, Benny Osborne, that was the handshake that we sought to and have um, seen replicated throughout the world. The Zubiquity Conferences are now the premier conference bringing together veterinarians and physicians, and um, there are more um, that are happening every year. Well, when this project started, I um, had left medicine, and I thought, well, this is just going to be about cancer and heart disease, autoimmune diseases, you know, real medical stuff. But over the course of doing research for the book, um, Catherine and I began to encounter um, a pretty sizable and growing literature about mental illness in animals. I'm talking about, not talking about laboratory animal investigation, I'm talking about spontaneously occurring mental illnesses in a wide range of animals. And compulsions um, from compulsive tail spinning to compulsive overeating where common mechanisms could be found, compulsive feather plucking, um, and in fact, as we looked and looked, we saw that there were scientific connections, but there were also opportunities to look at stigma and how we look at mental illness. Now, check, take a moment and check how you responded that, and consider your response to this. Right. So, um, in our class, and Catherine and I teach Coming of Age on Planet Earth together, um, we have students really begin to um, toggle between the human and the animal, not only from the scientific perspective to look for a mechanism, but also to interrogate themselves and challenge themselves um, around stigma and related issues. We also um, found what I think is really exciting. Um, as a connection between um, the growing uh, literature on adverse childhood events and the connection to both mental and physical pathology later in life, and um, what is now um, emerging in the veterinary literature. For example, traumatic experiences in the absence of positive socialization for young dogs is associated with behavioral disturbances and psychopathology later in life. And it goes on and on. There are many parallels. And ultimately, um, almost half of the chapters in Zubiquity were about mental illness the connections between mental illness and humans and animals. Well, one of the important connections um, between mental illness and animals and tonight's conversation is that 
human adolescents are uniquely vulnerable to mental illness, some specific forms of mental illness. And as many of um, you here tonight know, from between the ages of 12 and 24, or 10 and 24, we see um, the majority of mental illnesses that will occur presenting. So this is a, um, a developmental window of significant vulnerability. So what do we mean by vulnerability? Well, for two decades as a physician, I talked about vulnerability. And when I talked about it, I was talking about which human beings are vulnerable. I knew that people who smoked cigarettes were more vulnerable to lung cancer and heart attacks. And people with um, fair skin and red hair were more likely to develop more vulnerable to melanoma, right? It's what we call an intraspecific vulnerability, that is, within one species. But we wondered, what about the other form of vulnerability, or an expanded form of vulnerability, where we looked interspecifically, that is, between species, for the same challenges encountered in human life. Now, in doing this, we were, in, in some way, channeling the work of the Nobel laureate Nicholas Tinbergen. And in 1973, the same year that Dobzhansky published the essay, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Outside the Light of Evolution, the Nobel Committee awarded the prize to three biologists who studied insects, birds, and fish. And Tinbergen was one of them. And among his contributions, Tinberg asserted that in order to understand any biological phenomenon holistically, it wasn't enough to do what scientists typically do, which is to give a kind of reductionistic explanation. Like, why did the patient have a heart attack? Oh, because a blood clot lodged in the artery. Or because the platelets have this characteristic or that. That's reductionistic. Tinbergen said in order to understand holistically the real why, one needs to look between species, that is phylogenetically, and begin to consider why that vulnerability might be adaptive. And the word adaptive means why having that vulnerability might enhance that animal's um, chances at surviving and reproducing. But how to do this with respect to human problems like health problems and mental, physical and mental health problems? Well, ultimately, and this went on, I'm condensing years into um, a few sentences, but what we ended up um, doing was to use systematic review, which is a methodology in, in medicine to um, bring together a wide range of studies and find um, common uh, takeaways and translational um, uh, themes. And we applied the formal methods of systematic review to look broadly across the peer-reviewed animal literature to find out what species are vulnerable to such issues as congenital heart disease, myocardial infarction, osteosarcoma, lymphoma, anemia, et cetera. We, and we've done many more since then. And what we found um, was that there are cases that are widespread taxonomically. What does that mean? Well, it means that when you map those species that are vulnerable in that way onto these models that are used by evolutionary biologists to um, identify the relationship between species and their characteristics, you can begin to see uh, patterns and trends that can help you find out whether having that vulnerability is adaptive. This phylogeny, these are family trees, this is the most famous phylogeny in the world. It's the only illustration in The Origin of Species. And what I love about it is, you know, you see the, the trunk of the tree, the common ancestor and all the branches, but it's the humility. Look at that. That's Darwin wondering if he's right. You gotta love that. So what I wanna really quickly do is um, we're gonna talk about evolution and we're gonna be talking really about the last 500 million years or so when life on Earth um, had this magnificent um, explosion of diversity. 99% of the species living today emerged during that period. But the longer story, um, the history of the Earth, it's about 14.5 billion. Now we've got the moons forming, we've got the ocean, we've got volcanic activity above. We have no life yet, but we're gonna round out at about 3.5 billion. And now you see those little green bacteria 
And that's life under the water. There's little bubbles or photosynthesis coming online, still no life on Earth. And now we are um, rapidly heading toward 2 billion. We've got the beginnings of an ice age coming up. More and more photosynthesis oxygen is beginning to saturate the environment, an ice age. More diversity underwater, but still no life on land. And I wish I could just put push fast forward, but what we're getting to in just a moment will be at, when we get to about 500 million years, I'm going to stop. Because that's where we're going to focus for the rest of the night. To gain insights, this is a second ice age, more diversity jellyfish. Okay, here we go. Now we're here. I'm going to come back. All right. So here's what we're going to do now. I told you in the beginning that I was going to make the case that by looking across evolutionary time and across species, we can better understand why adolescents are so vulnerable to certain, well, we're going to talk about some medical issues. We're going to talk about accidents and injuries, sexual exploitation, and other forms of exploitation and mental illness. Let's start with something medical really quickly to show how it's done. So adolescents, fortunately, are very, very healthy. They don't tend to have a lot of heart disease. But one condition that affects some adolescents and young people is something called vasovagal fainting. And it's the kind of fainting that people have when they're having their blood drawn. They're scared. They're agitated. And when I used to teach medical students um, physiology and pathophysiology, I would say that one of the causes of this problem was that the heart, which should accelerate when someone is scared, right, fight or flight, instead, paradoxically, slows. Now, is it paradoxical? Well, it is paradoxical if all you have is a homo sapiens-centric lens. But as you broaden that out, and Catherine and I did a systematic review to identify other animals who had slowing of the heart when they were scared, when they were either being restrained, um, we found that, in fact, there were cases in every major taxa, every vertebral taxa, so from fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and numerous mammals. So then we asked, well, in what way could this vulnerability be adaptive? I mean, what is nothing adaptive about fainting when you're having your head, your, your blood drawn, you crack your head open. That's not adaptive. That's not fitness enhancing. It doesn't increase your survival. But remember, we are a very young species. We are about 200,000 years old. And we retain a tremendous amount of physiology, particularly autonomic physiology, cardiovascular physiology, and brain physiology that is shared by and evolved during the lives of our ancient ancestors who lived in the span of 200 million for mammals and 500 million for fish. There's a tremendous amount of shared, um, shared biology. I sometimes, um, you know, I'm deeply into this all the time, I'm fascinated by it, and continue to learn more and more. And I, I, I sometimes stumble on something that's so simple and so um, clarifying. And I cannot believe that um, I, it's, it's not sort of out there more. But I'd caution all of you to, I should ask all of you, and tell you that I ask my students um, in listening to all of this, to consider that we all have so many assumptions that are unexamined about the uniqueness of characteristics to our species. It's human exceptionalism. And human exceptionalism is alive and well in medicine. And it is, uh, there are endless numbers of assumptions of, of disorders and processes that we assume to be uniquely human. One component of that is that we tend to overestimate the degree to which the unique aspects of the human brain are controlling behavior versus the conserved and ancient um, shared brain systems. So that while some of our choices that we make, our decisions, are uniquely human, a great deal of our decision making and our emotions are based on common biology. So here's an example of how this might be adaptive. Um, so there are experiments from 20 to 30 years ago where they put EKG leads on deer, baby deer, and they play wolf howls. And what you see there is an EKG, and you, as the wolf howl is playing, you see the, the heart rate plummet. It's a rapid deceleration. And you see this. Now, how might that be adaptive? 
Well, I think you can begin to generate reasonable hypotheses that if this animal has predators that use motion and sound and um, uh, you know, just rustling of the, the leaves uh, to hunt, it would be adaptive to be still. And in fact, stillness, what's called tonic immobility, is widespread um, as, a, as an anti-predation strategy. Interestingly, this is something, this slowing of the heart rate is seen primarily in juvenile animals. And it seems that it is an adaptive strategy which is developmentally entrained. That is, until an animal has gotten strong enough to mount an effective fight or flight, it may be adaptive to um, have this response. And this is an example. Uh, don't worry, it has a happy ending. This is a young impala who had been chased by a cheetah. But a larger hyena um, got the impala. I want you to watch the impala, not the hyena. So. Um, Immobility can save lives. Let's go to um, tonight's, the promises that I've made. Well, adolescents take risks. Some take more than others. Some are really knuckleheaded, and some are, um, they are what they are. Well, if you ask, um, if in this auditorium, if you, um, let's, let's pretend that we are absolutely, um, we are completely human, we're, we're human exceptionalists, we're homo sapien centrics, and we say, why do adolescents take risks? Well, one of the common reasons, um, by the way, the, um, I should say that the, um, the mortality um, is very, you know, there's a steep rise in mortality between 12 and 19. Um, in some cases, up to five times the mortality. And as an evolutionary biologist, you wonder, how does that make sense in pre-reproductive animals, right? Because natural selection exerts its effect, right, maximally in that group. Well, if you ask someone who knows nothing about animals and doesn't even think animals have adolescence or risk-taking or whatever, why do adolescents take risks? The answer will be the teenage brain. And that's not wrong. Um, this I love. Young man, go to your room and stay there <laughs> until your prefrontal cortex develops. <laughs> So um, to make a long, long story short, and this is an, um, a, uh, such a simplification, but one component of the adolescent brain is that the prefrontal cortex, which is um, really underdeveloped in children and comes online to act as a governor and a regulator containing those limbic, those, those emotional, um, those impulses from below, um, that adolescence is a vulnerable period because that's not um, developed yet. And that's not wrong. But Catherine and I wanted to know, well, do non-human animals who are post-puberty, but not yet mature adults, that is in their wildhood, do they take greater chances and do they also have an increased mortality? And working with several of our graduate students over um, a long period of time, we reviewed over nearly a million and a half records and found that indeed they do. We built a phylogeny to show that in all, in, from fish all the way through birds, um, adolescent animals do have increased um, mortality. One of the reasons is that they underestimate risk. And we reviewed um, three of the large um, survey studies that looked at roadkill around the world and found that it was disproportionately fledgling and dispersing animals, that is adolescents, who were victims. We, uh, many of you may remember this adolescent whale who was trapped in Ventura Harbor. And we learned that adolescence is also a risk for whale strikes. Um, a, a, for some whale species, a common source of mortality. And why? Because they are inexperienced and they are predator naive. A major cause of mortality in the wild for adolescent animals is predation. They are easy prey, literally. In fact, because they are big enough in size to be outside of direct parental care and protection, but they lack experience, they fall for everything and they have among the highest mortality rates. There are even species of predators who actually specialize exclusively on adolescence. The big orcas, these killer whales, they um, don't bother with the, the adults. They're really hard to take down. And the calves, if they were separated, that'd be great. But they're usually with the, with the big moms and a bull escort sometimes, so they don't. But the adolescents, they're alone they're inexperienced, and they are targeted. And we found a range of other species that do the same thing. One of the things that adolescent animals don't know that older, more experienced adult animals do is that they are being watched. And they're being watched by predators who are doing one thing, 
choosing. And once they learn to um, once they learn to develop some of the signals of unprofitability, they become safer. But until then, they don't. So this is the iconic crossing, you know, the wildebeest um, crossing the Mara River. And there, there are tens of thousands of them. They're thirsty. It's hot as can be. And what I want to show you right now is something I'm gonna, that I'd like you to focus on. You're going to see when I run it, young, lithe wildebeest who are hot and thirsty jumping into the water, right? And remember, who else has come to the river? The crocodiles come. That's their feeding um, place. But what we're going to do as I run this, boom, young, lithe one jumps in. I want you to, another one, ooh, yummy. Look over here, right here. All right? So that is, the, that is experience. Inexperience, inexperience makes, cre creates risk. Experience makes you safe, but the paradox, of course, is how to become safe and experienced um, in a way that it incurs minimal risk. Well, um, one of the um, adaptations, you know, learning, we're now looking at evolutionary biologists are studying um, learning itself to understand how pedagogy works in the natural world and how adaptive and flexible it can be. And it's fascinating. And it makes sense because you are animals are born with some innate anti-predation um, ability, but a lot of it has to be learned, some by their parents if they have parental care, some by their peers. One uh, just example of the kind of anti-predation learning that's fascinating is something called predator inspection. And this meerkat, the first one is an adolescent. These conspecifics, are, I think this is a mixed age group, but they're approaching one of their predator predators, a Cape Cobra. They're encircling the snake. They're smelling. They're learning. They are learning about the most one of the most dangerous animals in their life. Now, predator inspection is dangerous, um, but as I'll tell you in a moment, it's important. These are two cheetahs in the foreground. I'll run it again. This is an adolescent coming forward, another adolescent here, and they're pausing. They're not fleeing, these cheetahs. They are pausing and learning and watching. And in a study of uh, the approaches of adolescent and adult Thompson gazelle, to cheetah, um, the investigator found that although the adolescents did have some upfront risk in the long run, predator inspection kept them safer as adults. And when you see something um, a characteristic widely across species that suggests that it has adaptive value, that it is increases survival or reproduction, and predator inspection we found in fish, in bats, in a, in a pretty wide range of animals, even in some invertebrates. Well. One of the important things that adolescents need to learn in order to be safe is they need to remember that, whatever that means, they, the awareness of um, that they're being watched and that predators are choosing. Adult animals do something um, which is they exhibit signals of unprofitability. So these, um, imagine that these animals are scared and they're being chased by uh, those cheetahs. Why would they waste calories? And anyway, why would they go vertical when they'd want to be going horizontal? And the answer is this behavior, it's called stotting. It is quality advertisement. They are basically saying to the predators with their actions, I'm really fit. I am really, you know, you can try to get me, but don't waste your calories. And remember, predators need to make smart choices. Predators like other wild animals are navigating the straits of survival, of predation and starvation, right? Calories count. All right. So I'm just going to move on um, to sexual exploitation and inexperience. So before we begin to talk about the exploitative aspects of this, I just want to talk a little bit about sexuality in the wild, and particularly um, beginners, sec beginning sexuality. So. We um, look pretty broadly um, at puberty comparatively, and one of our chapters is called um, Jurassic Puberty. And we, and to make a long story short, puberty, the, the cascade of the, the endocrine, the neuroendocrinology of puberty is highly conserved across mammals. It's remarkable. Sorry, across vertebrates, including fish. And, um, but one of the things that's really interesting is that animals in the wild don't just hit puberty and start having sex, which is what I thought. I mean, again, I was, I'm being, I, I knew very little about 
the wild the animal behavior, behavioral ecology, any of it. And, but, but it turns out that's not always the case. Now, sometimes it is the case, but often it isn't. And it isn't because it, an animal can have a body that can reproduce. That is, um, you know, a male can be making spermatozoa that could conceive but they may lack the behavioral repertoire, the social intelligence, the cultural information that they need either to attain dominance or to attract um, a mate. One example is whale song. So we know that the humpbacks, right, have this sub, um, these beautiful, the males come together and they have these loud, beautiful choruses of song. Well, when it's done just right, um, they're, um, it is believed by some of some whale investigators that the whale song, in many whales together, hits the body of the female and it induces ovulation. At that point, she turns around and she swims, probably as fast as she can, to the source of the sound. But imagine that an adolescent humpback, and they have studied how adolescent male humpbacks learn these songs, he's not very good at it. And so it takes years, years for these adolescent males to achieve um, the, the song, the cadence, and it's very musical and there's a lot to learn. Sexual communication takes a lot of experience and adolescent animals may be biologically able to have offspring, but that doesn't mean that they're having offspring necessarily. Similarly, um, it's really a very similar phenomenon. There are a group of French biologists who have identified a specific, um, like a little cadenza that the species of canaries sing that can induce ovulation in the female. But again, not the first time you try these songs. So there is a learning um, process. Well, um, these are Lays and Albatross who are wonderful. And these are mature adults who really um, have mastered uh, this kind of sexual communication. They're coordinated, they're synchronized, they've got the twist and hold, the beak fencing, and compare them with these adolescents, the eighth graders at the junior prom. You can see elements of the dance, but they haven't gotten it right. And it takes seasons um, for them to learn. Similarly, um, sometimes mature bald eagles, and you can tell by the white plumage on their heads, um, as a pre-copulatory uh, uh, behavior, they extend their talons, they link them, and they spiral down um, to the ground. But again, this is not something that you go through puberty and instantly can do. Um, these are adolescents. You can see that the plumage is immature on the head, and we're going to see a talon extension. So it takes time and practice to be a good partner. Well, I want to get a tiny bit political for just a moment. And I'm going to suggest that, um, that as part of this um, trying to turn to the natural world for insights into human health, so scientific insights, and um, also there are some insights that we can draw to help us lead better lives as humans, whether it's destigmatizing mental illness and other issues, um, or having healthier conversations about consent and coercion, something that we talk about in our class, which is a big conversation for undergraduates. So here's point number one. When you see these grebes doing their thing, which is just so amazing, they are have, they're courting each other. The courtship is not a ritual. Courtship is not a dance. You've heard courtship ritual, courtship dance, but it's not a ritual or a dance. Rituals and dances have preset steps and sequences. Courtship is a conversation. It's a conversation between two animals. Should we or shouldn't we? Are we or aren't we? And it has an outcome, an ending that is not known at the beginning. And language is important. And um, I think if we can begin thinking about courtship as communication and recognizing that learning sexual communication can take a long time, um, that can become, I think, part of the conversation um, around, around consent and coercion on campuses. To reinforce that, um, these are flies who are courting each other. And the, um, the sequence, there's a, there it is. There's a song, a, a fluttering that they play. And this is a real conversation with many, many steps to it. And um, 
the brains of Drosophila have been studied, both the male and the female brain. And during this conversation, there is, there is a kind of a yes and a no and a yes and a no. It's multifactorial. I'm condensing it into an overly simplified form. But I think it's important to break it down because there is both a neurobiology of coercion probably, but also a neurobiology of no. And this is um, just to show the complexity of it. So not a court, not a dance, not a ritual, a conversation. One other point I want to make is that um, there's a term receptivity that's used in biology. And that describes some of the signs of, um, of female fertility, right? So you've, taken, you've seen documentaries, you know that um, some female animals exhibit physical signs or um, odors or things that say that they are fertile, that they're ovulating. The term receptivity has been conflated and is used for fertility. But for reasons I think um, that are clear, uh, should be clear, we don't want to do that. I think we, we don't want to do that anymore. I think it's better to call fer, fer, receptivity fertility and leave receptivity um, out of the conversation. Because horses, like humans, can signal disinterest and interest and have partner preference even if they are fertile. Well, let's talk about um, early puberty and younger age exploitation. We know that being an adolescent, being a young adult, um, is a high risk period for sexual violence. Um, if an individual is going to be sexually um, uh, assaulted or have sexual violence um, uh, against them in their lifetime, it's most likely going to happen between the ages of 10 and 24. College, um, college age women, 18 to 24, it's very high. There's a whole literature about what's called the red zone, inexperienced college freshmen having the highest rates of sexual assaults on campus. Again, kind of, a, if you will, a kind of predator naivete, not really um, understanding. But um, early puberty is also part of the picture. We know that, um, the, well, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, in 2017 published um, a review that looked uh, at early puberty and uh, established that absolutely it is a risk factor for sexual abuse. And girls who um, have early puberty um, not only are more sexually vulnerable as a consequence, uh, probably related to that, they have greater rates of depression, school, poor school performance dropout. There's a lot of very negative downstream consequences. And this is, I'm gonna briefly um, uh, share this with you. This is Lena Medina. So she had central precocious puberty. So the precocious puberty, the early puberty rather, that we're seeing more and more is related to the fact that young girls are, have higher body mass indexes than they used to. So um, when the body mass is higher, it's more likely to have earlier menstruation and secondary sexual um, characteristics. Well, there's another form of early puberty um, that can happen much younger. Um, and the same thing is true. These girls are vulnerable. Um, Lena Medina was a Peruvian girl. And at five years of age, she presented with an abdominal mass, um, which was thought to be an abdominal mass. But it turned out she was pregnant. Actually, she delivered, um, she delivered at five years of age. And of course, um, she was sexually assaulted. And um, Lena Medina is uh, kind of a very famous case, but I want to just drive home that this is really an issue that is hiding in plain sight as more and more girls um, do enter puberty when in fact they're children. So they may have bodies that are adolescent or adult, but they are children and therefore vulnerable. We can turn to the animal world to reinforce this point in a way that um, I think is unique and helpful. So ring-tailed lemurs, right? They're from Madagascar. And um, in Madagascar, they are, first of all, they're a female dominant society. So the, the females, like spotted hyenas, the females are, you know, um, the dominance. And in um, dominant animal societies, it's really unusual to see male sexual coercion on females. But, um, and in Madagascar, uh, the lemur, are born, it's hard to get calories in the wild, and so they're lean, and they actually don't go through puberty until they're about two or two and a half. But by that time, they've also mastered the behaviors of dominance. They become dominant females, and as a consequence, the males leave them alone. They, there really is apparently no sexual coercion. But 
Off the coast of Georgia, there are populations of ring-tailed lemur that were brought there as part of study. And there is some human provisioning. So they're getting more calories than they would in Madagascar. And as a result, they're reaching puberty about a year earlier than they would in the wild. But they, so they're, they're biologically mature females, but they lack the behaviors of dominance. And now, for the first time, there is, um, they have become se uh, targets of sexual coercion. Um, and that is, I think, um, a really, not a metaphorical parallel, I think a real parallel, and an opportunity to begin um, thinking about vulnerability um, in an expanded way. Young age is also a risk. Um, off the coast of California, there's moss landing up, up in, um, toward Northern California, and there is this population of sea otter, and they're, you know, they're adorable. Um, but a study uh, by Harrison Tinker, this is a group, so they're affiliated with the aquarium up there at Monterey and also with UC Davis Vet Med. Um, they did a study of um, 19 carcasses that they found of uh, harbor seals, juvenile harbor seals, male and females, and some young sea otters as well. And um, basically, the, the sea otter were attacking them, and um, they were sexually assaulting them. Now, the reason that this is, I think, important is that the animals they were targeting were young. They were younger than they were. They were both male and female, and that's an important perspective as well, that you know we think of sexual assault sometimes as a primarily female issue, but absolutely, there's a very important male perspective. And the youth aspect of it that we see in the harbor seal case is paralleled in the human case as well. Are there adaptations? Are there um, opportunities for animals? Are there evolved solutions, let's say? Well, there's a fascinating a bit of physiology that exists in Madagascar among the fusa. And fusa are the civet-like cats that are actually the predators of the lemur. And the um, young female fusa, so the juveniles, as they enter adolescence, um, for reasons that, and this is speculative, this is a hypothesis, they, um, they transform briefly, transiently, into full phenotypic males. They are, um, they become male, including they, so this is a male, so this is an adult male, and this is his penis, and you see their, their spines, it's called the spinescent penis, literally spines sticking off of it. So this is the glands and this is the shaft. And you can see an adult female has a clitoris, but you see that what happens with the adolescent um, females is that they develop these spiny penises, they become morphologic males. And it is an interesting hypothesis as we begin to sort of put this lens um, uh, on to begin to go back to what we know about animals and look at some of the adaptations and think about um, what they are um, in response to. It's a broader conversation. But I think it's important, there's an opportunity now to go back. You know, we now know that the lenses that have been used to look at the wild for so long were primarily um, one gender and one um, culture. And of course, we want to do good science, but ultimately as human beings, um, to some extent, we see what we already know. And so I think um, turning um, new lenses on nature is a real important um, thing to do. Well, I want to round out with um, increased vulnerability to anxiety, depression, and particularly how this might even connect to social media. So we know that um, there's a, a very significant vulnerability to anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental illness during adolescence. Between the ages, right, of um, by the age of 14, 50% of mental illnesses, if an individual is going to develop a major mental illness, half the time it will have presented by 14, 75% of the time by the age of 24. So a very high risk period. Is there a comparative perspective? How can looking across species and evolutionary time help us generate novel, testable hypotheses and potentially understand this important vulnerability in our species? Well, I want to just go back to that 500 million year, more or less, that Cambrian explosion, to say that it's important because these are schooling fish or schooling aquatic species who are living socially. These are animals who are living in groups. And when animals live in groups, that means they have relationships with each other. Now, you may look at that picture and think that they're all clones. And I don't know what species these are. 
I'm assuming they're not clones. There are some animals that are clones. But when you look at a flock of birds, for example, you probably don't focus in on the individuality of each of those birds, but they are individuals. And that is the insight that I want to kind of um, drive home now. These fish look very similar, and in our book we um, talk about why that is, something called the conformity effect, and um, something called the oddity effect, and which I think maybe connects to um, uh, some aspects of xenophobia. But these fish are absolutely individuals. They're males and females. Some are healthier than others. Some have had um, traumatic experiences, near misses, et cetera, et cetera. And one core component of these relationships is that every one of these fish understands where she ranks, sits, what her status is relative to every other fish in the group. Fish, ancient fish, had very honed, um, highly honed social brains to negotiate relationships. So this is um, the idea that they're clones, they're not, they're individuals, right? They have relationships with each other. And one important component of their relationship with each other is status, and status forms these hierarchies. And it turns out whether you're a fish in a school or a bird in a flock or a wildebeest in a herd, status matters. Higher status animals eat more, have greater access to safe places to live. They tend to have more mating opportunities, a literal description of fitness, increased survival, increased reproduction. And as a consequence, there's a big drive to gain status. Well, what motivates an animal to make the effort? Well, if you take a step back and consider that sensation evolved in animals, our animal ancestors, hundreds of millions of years ago, and the brain biology that produces sensations, pain and pleasure, these sensations evolved to shape the behavior of animals towards greater fitness. So for example, um, hunger drive, motivates an animal to eat, which it needs to stay alive, and pleasure rewards the eating process, which reinforces, ah, that felt good, do it again. Sex is the same thing. Animals seek, they have, they're rewarded. Sensations, pain and pleasure, physical, evolved to push animals toward fitness behaving activities and to have them avoid fitness reducing activities. Pain, physical pain, fear. Well, consider what I just said, that rising in status is one of the most fitness enhancing um, um, things that a social animal can do. And so, brain biology changes in animals when they rise in status. And when they fall in status, it changes again in ways that are sensed by the animal as, I'm going to use pleasure like this, um, pleasure and pain. So let's talk about how this works. So imagine that two fish um, are see each other, and they're going to, the, the status is going to be determined. Um, there's a kind of a face-off, you could say. And what's really happening is that the their, st their brains, the status part of their brain, the social uh, behavioral network, the status behavioral network, and particularly, interestingly, the serotonin networks, these um, dense pathways that are remarkably conserved. And by that I mean um, the pathways and quite mechanistically conserved across chordates from fish, reptiles, um, birds, and mammals. And so, they have their contest, and one does well and one does not. One rises in status, one falls in status. And we see a shift in uh, what's going on. You can see that the green gets darker, that these are the, ser the green and yellow are the serotonergic pathways, the network. And fish A has won and has this neurochemical experience that is a kind of atta girl. And fish B has lost and has a different chemical experience. Now, you can't ask a fish how they feel. But you can watch their behavior. And it turns out that um, when status goes up, right, you see serotonergic networks activated and the opposite um, when they have status descent. These two zebra fish, this is from the Riken Institute in Japan, um, they're about to have a contest. And you'll see the winner do a little victory dance and the loser um, quite the opposite. 
And um, the gills, I don't know if you can see, this is, this is a living fish. This is, um, this is after multiple losses, by the way. There's a cascade. But this is the point. Now, again, we can't ask how they feel, but it's notable all of the therapists in this group, I think um, there's, um, and many people have observed this, that there, are, there does seem to be a connection between the behavior of severely depressed human beings and wild animals or even lab animals who have multiple losses. Let's look at some other examples. And by the way, we did a systematic review and found that from crustaceans all the way um, across vertebrates, this relationship between serotonin networks and status is conserved. So um, there's a neurobiology of winning and losing. Um, these two lizards are facing off, and you'll see that there's a clear winner. It's like a world wrestling match and a clear loser. And boom. And in fact, um, the same thing, you, I'll, I'll get to the studies in a second, but these, you see activation of the same um, networks with losing. When an animal is targeted for bullying, they're typically falling on the social or having social dissent or at the bottom. And you can see that the pig, um, the white and black pig, right, is the target animal. So um, mammals also, this has been shown. And birds as well. The bird, this is a targeted uh, bird. You see the other birds who are sort of um, dominant are following the, the bully and the, the targeted. So there's a brain chemistry. There's a neurobiology of this relationship. These are relational experiences that are being processed by these animal social brain networks to create um, a chemistry that results in behavior in them, but mood and behavior in us. So this is widespread um, from fish, social status, differences regulate, are regulated by serotonin. Serotonin power has a, profoundly influences the social behavior of these frogs, and of course, um, in um, primates and um, other mammals. Uh, this was actually a UCLA study many years ago uh, that was done, dominant vertebrate monkeys in college fraternity males. They were UCLA. Um, so what's the connection? You probably read my mind, serotonin. We hear about serotonin because serotonin, of course, is one component of a complex neurobiology that underlies human mood, both depression, anxiety, and more. And in 1988, when Prozac came in the market, Prozac, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which works by increasing the availability of serotonin in, the, in that synapse in the brain. We, that was the beginning, um, looking back, I certainly didn't know of this connection in my mind now between animal relationships that evolved 500 million years ago, navigating those relationships, status, and how we feel, the power of our own moods. Serotonin and fluoxetine, rather, Prozac, it is being used to treat, um, treat animals who have a range of um, social stress-related disorders, including feather plucking. Studies on a lobster show that serotonin fluctuations are associated with status, but that you give Prozac, you give fluoxetine to these lobsters, you put it in the um, tank, and they have a status reversal. So there, there is serotonin is the lingua franca between status and moods. And um, there's a really wonderful opportunity. I'm gonna zip through this to um, just get to social media and then, and then I'll, I'll be done. Why is this relevant to modern adolescents? Okay, status goes up and down, causes serotonin to go back and forth. And we know that serotonin plays a role in mood because if you go back to what a contest is, if you go back to those fish in the hierarchy, what they are basically doing is they're having the experience of comparison. They are ranking each other, assessing each other. They are being ordered. They're creating an order. And the biology of comparison or the neurobiology of comparison is ancient, as you can see, and it's modern. It is driving, it underlies the um, shift in moods I believe that our adolescents and others are experiencing um, all day, every day, with an increasing numbers of assessments and rankings and tests, but also what happens on social media. Because if ever there was a concentrated dose of comparison, it is social media. How many followers, how many likes? And most importantly, it gives 
an opportunity, gives young people an opportunity to push themselves out in the world as they want others to see them, but then experience assessments that may be unfavorable. Comparison and social media connects to the neurobiology of comparison in ancient fish. I really believe that um, human exceptionalism is a blindfold. And I say that because I was wearing it. I really had no, um, very little knowledge. I, I knew nothing about animal psychopathology. Um, very little, um, never occurred to me that individual fish have partner preferences, and they do. Sexual partner preferences, friendships. I mean, the, the, um, the scope of it is extreme. Human exceptionalism was my blindfold, and by pulling it off, I was able to, with Catherine, see connections across species, phylogenetically diverse species, that have helped us to make connections that we hope can help young human animals lead happier and healthier lives. And I'm going to end by um, reading to you um, the wonderful, um, a little bit from the um, speech that was made when the Nobel Assembly awarded um, Nico Tinberg and Carl von Frisch and Conrad Lorenz the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology in 1973 for founding the field of animal behavior. The discoveries made by this year's Nobel Prize laureates were based on the studies of insects, fish, and birds, and might, might thus seem to be only of minor importance for human physiology or medicine. However, their conclusions likely will hold true for all species, including for that which in shameless vanity has baptized itself, homo sapiens. Thank you. Thank you. That was the most fascinating lecture I have ever heard. And I think everybody here will agree with me. That was just exceptional. And I we just got a great education. And I have a question. Can we all sign up for your class at Harvard? That was just amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Natterson Horowitz has graciously offered to take questions from the floor. Um, so we're going to be passing the mic. And please wait to uh, have the mic brought to you. Who, Ernie. It? And who, who choose? Oh, does Ernie choose? Or how? No, I, okay. You, 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 you choose. Okay. All right. Right there. Terry. How did the five year olds become pregnant? Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I understand the body mass, but uh, no, no, no. She had a specific. She had. There's most early puberty these days is from. There are a few theories, but increased body mass is one. Uh, possibly endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment. But there's another form of truly precocious puberty, which has to do with which is a brain problem. It's called central precocious puberty. So she had a medical, an endocrine medical condition that caused her young body. Fortunately, it's very rare to go through puberty. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. This was fascinating. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was sure. Delightful. Um, my question has to do with uh, um, bullies. What's going on in their brain? Are they making more serotonin? You know, what 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 regulates their behavior, and, and does Prozac control it? So we had a Zubiquity conference um, several years ago where we looked uh, comparatively at bullying. So we had experts in human bullying and um, animal bullying. And the book, actually, we have uh, a, a nice chunk of um, content about different kinds of bullying in the animal kingdom. So I can't really make a generalization about all bullies. But um, one insight that was really interesting um, for me was that the uh, the that not all bullying is based on, I mean, Bullying is often a, a target animal who's low ranking, but but sometimes there's um, there may be more purposeful. So when I showed the fish swimming and they all looked like clones, and I said, "Oh, that's something called the conformity effect." 
So it turns out one of there's a, there's a really logical, evolutionarily logical explanation for why animals in groups tend to look like each other. And the reason is it's very hard for predators to track one animal when there are a lot moving like that. So as a consequence of that, um, animals tend to, well, fish, for example, ass assort themselves when they're assorting into with other animals who are about the same color, the same size, even the tail beat frequency, um, they try to match up. Now, what's interesting, what that means is that when there's an odd fish, right, um, that fish is not typically allowed, so to speak, um, into that particular group. But the reason for that is that not only is that odd individual, and that's their word, not mine, um, does she attract more predators, by being in that group, the entire group is exposed to greater predation rate. So, so it's, it's, um, it's interesting to sort of begin thinking, and you know, we want to hew very closely to science, and we want to be conservative with our hypotheses. On the other hand, we want to shine light where there is, and where we can uh, generate reasonable hypotheses. And one idea, Catherine and I found um, oddity effect in birds, in wildebeest, in there's just studies that have looked at it. But um, it's interesting to ask the question: the most, uh, the leading form of bullying among middle school students is appearance-based bullying. And is there some ancient connection? I'm asking, I'm really asking, is there some ancient connection to this um, taxonomically, phylogenetically very diverse phenomenon? Hi, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, you, early on you contrasted Wilson and Gould and you, but you didn't go into it at all. What's what was the contrast that you were expressing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the the basic issue was that, and I'm you know not an, there. There are historians of science who focus on this, but basically, sociobiology. E. O. Wilson was looking at. I mean, ants are the famous one, but he looked at a lot of species to try to um, use like what's happening with groups of animals, for example, to understand human life. But I, I think that there were there are a lot of problems with uh, at that time. I think really a, a central problem, frankly, because a lot of the ideas that he uh, published are accepted now. You know, nobody even questions them. But I mean, you think about what happened during World War II, right? And the use of, um, for example, vermin metaphor, um, and you know, uh, the, the the and in fact, it's really a very interesting story. Just a side note is that so the three men who won the Nobel Prize. So Nico Tinbergen, right, he was the one who came up with that idea about you know, looking beyond the proximate causes. But Conrad Lorenz, the two of them were best friends and scientific partners in 1937. They spent a spring together at Lorenz's gorgeous lake house in, you know, in Austria. His father was a rich physician. And they founded the field. I mean, they did, a, they did foundational experiments. Then the war happens. In, in 1939, there's the annexation of Austria. And Lorenz goes on to become a leading member of the scientific arm of the SS, what was called the racial, it's, it's, it's a, a long German word, but basically racially profiling and deciding who was Aryan enough and who wasn't. His former partner, best friend, um, I'm saying best friend, but that I, I've, I've reviewed a lot of their letters. Um, ended up in a, um, he, re, he defied the Nazification of his university, the University of Leiden. He was thrown into a hostage camp for two years and then um, Wuf, which was a concentration camp in Holland. So, um, and then the, uh, that camp was liberated, but um, the northern part of Holland was still occupied and he walked back into um, the Nazi territory, which is where his family was, and then he went through the Dutch hunger famine. So, I mean, it's really an incredible story. The reason I bring up Lorenz is that Lorenz, um, Lorenz kind of whitewashed his, his, his Nazi stuff, but in 2014, um, a group of scholars at the University of Salzburg started um, translating what Lorenz and others had written during the 40s, and he actually literally um, describes um, you know, inferior humans who should be, uh, you know, removed um, and cleansed um, to uh, animals. So, you know, in the context of how animal life was being um, n n abused and, and eugenics and pseudoscience and all that, I think that it was an understandable 
it, it was, it, 30 years was not enough, I think. And, but there was a war. I mean, it really was very, it was a lot of antipathy during that time. Yeah. Uh, I would first like to say thank you. I was very fascinated by your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about whether or not the fish, uh, once they are dropped in social status, if they try to regain that status or whether that leads to a deeper sense of depression. Right. So um, I, I had never, again, you know, there's a big literature about everything. And, you, you know, but so there's something called the loser effect. And I mean, it's a terrible term. Um, in fact, I, I, I felt bad writing a like, loser on there, but it is what, what happens is, um, and it seems maladaptive, but it, so when there's that, there, you've got those two brains, let's just forget the fish. Let's say it's two brains, two social brains competing. One wins, one loses. The, not only is there the pleasure of rising in status, I'm going to say pleasure, but you know, it, it, it's, it's reinforcing behavior. Um, it changes the behavior. So the winner Having so, if the two are absolute 50 50 odds, each one a, a and B, even odds, having one, the neurobiological changes of winning make that fish literally more likely statistically to win again. And having lost makes that neurobiologically more likely to lose. And the more that you lose, the more that you lose. And it becomes more and more severe. And you actually see almost a dose response curve in terms of what's happening with the serotonergic activation. And it's more complicated than that. But as a consequence, these hierarchies that you see, I mean, this, this winner and loser effect, um, it's, it's, it's established. It doesn't mean that it can't be reversed. And in the book, we, we talk about some of the ways that that does actually sometimes happen um, in the natural world. Uh, yeah, I don't know who I'm supposed to. Hi there, Hi. thank you. This is fascinating, my head is still spinning. Um, I was wondering if, there would be some kind of human equivalent to starting and uh, signaling unprofitability. Um, in Zubiquity, we, we devote a lot of real estate to that. Um, absolutely. And again, this is what I love. Um, you know, it's not metaphor to say what I'm going to say. I, it is um, animal behavior with us as animals. So think of the things that you do. Um, I'll think of what I do. When I'm scared, when I'm walking down, it's dark, and I haven't, and this is sort of obvious, you know, you're, um, you know, somebody told me in high school to put the keys between my, my fingers, you know, like that's going to do anything. But um, I do stand up straighter, and I walk like that. And that is actually something you see animals do. They, um, they're alerting the predator that they've lost the element of surprise. So one of the purposes, there's quality advertisement, like, look at me, I'm really um, vigorous. But it's also saying, you know what? You've been made. Um, so there are a lot of things like that. I mean, putting a, a, a burglar alarm on your lawn, we, in Zubiquity, we have a whole list of them. I don't remember what they are. But we do it all the time. We're saying, you know what? Don't even try. Go elsewhere. Yeah. OK, we have time for one more last question. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was so fascinating. Excuse me. Um, I'm wondering about the adolescents in the, the beginning, the vulnerability when they all, the younger ones and inexperienced ones, went into the river, whatever that was, and the others backed up. I'm wondering about communication. Do the elders not communicate to the adolescents that that's dangerous? And more important, do, they, do the adolescents listen, or are they rebellious? <laughs> like the teenagers are. So yeah, I mean, there's a, an entire field of, of behavioral ecology that has to do with parental care. And it's growing, and it's fascinating. And um, so there is some, uh, undoubtedly, some social learning that young animals get from their parents. You know, there's, that's, a, that's clear, uh, you know, mammals particularly. But having said that, there is this unique neurobiology of adolescence. You know, the, the adolescent brain, when, when we say, oh, it's the teenage brain, the adolescent brain, it's not wrong. It's just not unique to humans. So because if you think about it, remember that first, that all physiology, all of our human physiology evolved through selection, through these processes. And the neurobiology that drives behavior is no different. 
for an animal to do the things that it needs to do, it needs to be motivated. There needs to be sensation to motivate it. And adolescent animals, wildebeest, for example, uh, mammals, have a neurobiology that causes them to be less fearful of new things, to be more exuberant, so to speak. It's called neophilia. And it translates into a greater pleasure reward, sort of the reductionistic explanation. Um, but the purpose of it, the function, the adaptive value, is it's getting the animal to do what it needs to do. Now, not so adaptive to jump into the Mara River when there are a lot of crocodiles. But in, in the whole, by um, this neophilia drives um, adolescent animals from their natal burrows and dens and nests. And that's a necessary and important part of growing up, um, even if sometimes it's dangerous and scary. On that note, let's give a huge round of applause to Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz. You can purchase a copy of Wildhood out in the foyer, and, and Dr. Natterson Horowitz will be out there to sign it for you. Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you at future Open Mind programs. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>